welcome to the program. The biggest surge in fighting in eastern Ukraine began last month. For more than a week, the eastern town of Avdivka was left without heat and power. That was the biggest bout of violence since the Minsk II agreement. Since then, the fighting has died down, but sporadic shelling continues. Joining us in the studio to discuss the Minsk peace deal as well as other events is Mariana Betza. She is Ukraine's foreign ministry spokesperson. Welcome. Thank you so much for the invitation. So uh, parts of the Minsk agreement are quite ambiguous and uh, sound a bit ineffective. Now, the one about uh, elections in Donbass, which must be held under Ukrainian law, but which Moscow isn't so keen on um, uh, continuing with and doesn't show any indication of actually um, fulfilling. Now, what sort of uh, success does the Minsk ceasefire have um, in this type of stalemate? Well, first of all, I would like to underline that the Minsk agreements uh, are comprehensive documents. They comprise of three documents. The Minsk Protocol of September 2014, the Minsk Memorandum of 2014, and the Package of Measures, which was adopted in uh, February 2015 and endorsed by the UN Security Council. So these are uh, not Minsk 1, Minsk 2, but in general, the Minsk Agreement, a roadmap for the peaceful settlement of the dispute. The dispute, which is actually between Russia and Ukraine, which is actually the conflict waged, full-fledged full waged by the Russian Federation against the, in our country. And uh, regarding the ceasefire, I would say that not a single provision till now it has been implemented by the Russian Federation. The Minsk agreements were signed by Ukraine, the Russian Federation and the OECE. And these are three signatories. And that's why we have trilateral contact group, though the Russian deliberately tries to avoid the word trilateral and to use contact group just to put it into Russian narrative and to use Donetsk, Lugansk as if we have to speak as a dialogue between Ukraine and so-called proxies, Russian proxies. But in general, these are three signatories and the Russian Federation so far hasn't implemented none of the provision. The first provision was ceasefire. We had numerous occasions when we agreed either in the Normandy 4 meeting or within the trilateral contact group to launch ceasefire which would be comprehensive, verifiable and durable. None of this happened. And the last Normandy meeting, which took place in Munich in um, February last, this year, uh, testified to the fact that the Russian Federation is not willing to implement the, the provisions. It was uh, actually, again, the same narrative, again, the same provision that Ukraine has to be blamed and nothing else. And this is actually very um, indeed disappointing. And it's about lives of people. It's not. Uh, Ukraine uh, just about the territory, it's about lives of people. We have lost more than 10,000 people. Uh, part of our territory has been illegally occupied in grave breach of international law by the Russian Federation. We have full-fledged Russian aggression in Donbass, uh, Russian regular troops along with the Russian proxies. And it is extremely difficult to speak to the Russian Federation when they repeat the same narrative and has shown no political sign and no political willingness to implement Minsk and to de-escalate the situation. I see. Now, recently, I'm not really sure how the Ukrainian government sees this. Recently, uh, Kremlin leader Vladimir Putin, he legalized these passports that the uh, Russian-backed militants have been issuing to uh, residents of uh, occupied regions in, in eastern Ukraine. Now, obviously, this is a step back, if not almost a creeping uh, annexation of Ukraine's Donbass region. Now, how does Ukraine plan to reply to this? What kind of response does the government have? Obviously, this is a step back and obviously this is absolutely null and void decision by the Russian government. Uh, and Ironically and cynically, it was made exactly during the Normandy talks in Munich on 18th February. And uh, this is again another blatant violation of sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And uh, another act to the occupation of these territories by the Russian Federation, which was strongly condemned. And there was a, a command of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the President of Ukraine, where we definitely and strongly uh, condemned these absolutely illegal acts by the Russian Federation. But again, this is a sign that Russia is not willing to go and to abide by international law and to abide by Minsk. But what concrete steps does the government plan to take now that Putin has gone further and legalized these documents? Does the government have any strategy 
Well, the best strategy is, first of all, to, to continue our work within the trilateral contact group and the Normandy format, because right now these are the only formats. We can have different formats, but everything depends on Russia. Russia is an aggressive state and it committed a crime. And Crimea is actually a Russian crime against peace, humanity, against sovereignty of Ukraine and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Russia blatantly violated UN Charter, Helsinki Final Act, uh, many other norms of international law and Minsk agreements. And obviously, we have to sit at the same table to return Russia to the tenets of international law. Otherwise, there is no way out. The second strategy is, obviously, we need to be very successful inside. What Russia fears, the success of Ukraine. Russia wants Ukraine to be totally chaotic, totally destabilized and absolutely weak, economically, politically, military, but it doesn't succeed and it understands that. And also the sanctions which we have against Russia, I do think that no one in Russia could have predicted that the sanctions against Russia could have lasted for three years ongoing. And these are really painful sanctions. And the more painful they become, the more difficult it is for Russia regardless of their narrative. And therefore, from our side, first of all, we have to be really successful inside. We have to pursue the reforms in different fields. The success fields. Of, of Ukraine's of, reform, uh, progress, uh, so uh, on, pro so on. Progress, but, yeah, reform, reform track. We have to be successful. But which points of the Minsk agreement would you revise? W what would Ukraine do better to make the Minsk agreements uh, effective for the country? We have to start with the number one, and the number one is ceasefire. It hasn't lasted even for, for a few hours, to be honest. I mean, we have had so many agreements when the ceasefire sh should be in force. And uh, there was sort of Russian agreement on that within the trilateral contact group or Normandy format, but it never worked out. I mean, we see on the yesterday 116 attacks on UAE positions from Russian hybrid forces, from Russian regular forces and proxies. We also see that one person was killed and more than 15 wounded. And we deeply uh, uh, Emphasize with the families of, 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 the, of, the relative, of the relatives of these people, and it, it's indeed Russia does not care not only about international law, not only about Minsk agreement. It does not care about human lives, and this is, I think, the most difficult part. They do not care about uh, human lives not only in Ukraine but in other countries as well. If we look in a more wider geopolitical aspect and we take Syria and we take even Russian Federation itself. So many people get arrested just for saying a word on Twitter or Facebook. If we look in, ad, on Russian citizens, they're afraid to speak because they're afraid for their safety. So uh, the best we way is just to start from number one. Ceasefire should be absolutely durable, verifiable, comprehensive and should be also, of course, verified by the OECE because we no, do need Just to monitors. stop you there. So yeah. we've spoken about you've just mentioned geo geopolitics and what that means for Ukraine. Now, UK Foreign Minister Boris Johnson was was in Kiev uh, in uh, in the beginning of March. Now, what kind of strategy did Ukraine have uh, there? Did what was the kind of main um, point that was made during closed door meetings? What what was agreed upon? What was his key message? What did Ukraine get out of this? Well, it was a great visit and I would say that we are extremely uh, grateful uh, to our partners because it was actually a joint visit of Boris Johnson and Mr. Vyshikovsky, the Polish minister to Ukraine. And we had also another visit on the same day, on the next day of uh, German foreign minister. Uh, it was a great visit of three ministers who, first of all, uh, totally supported Ukraine again, reiterated the support of Ukraine's sovereignty. Uh, secondly, they condemned annexation of uh, Crimea uh, and uh, redrawing of borders in Europe, which is totally unacceptable. Thirdly, they again underlined that there are no illusions in the world about Russia and Russia's role and Russian aggression. And uh, they also support very much Ukraine in terms of reforms, uh, in terms of social and economic reforms and rehabilitation of our uh, former servicemen and uh, also training of our servicemen. So we're extremely grateful for our partners for this solidarity and partnership. What did Boris Johnson promise post-Brexit Britain? Is it going to continue supporting Ukraine in the same way it has before the Brexit vote? Well, uh, personally, I surmise that regardless of Brexit, uh, the support of UK is really strong. Uh, UK is one of our staunchest supporters, and uh, I believe that we will have strategic relationship, whatever happens after Brexit.
Very good. Now, uh, speaking about going going back to geopolitics and um, Ukraine, the the Avdivka bout of violence, which which happened at the beginning of, of February, it happened right after a phone call was exchanged between um, uh, Kremlin leader Putin and the newly elected U.S. President Donald Trump. Many said this was basically Trump, uh, Putin testing Trump in Ukraine. Now, if if that was so, and it seems that Ukraine doesn't have a lot, a lot to say in these geo, geopolitical talks. Now, do you think that it's worth uh, counting on these kind of closed door meetings, which Ukraine hasn't been invited to? Do you think that Ukraine should have a say in that? Well, uh, yes, the situation in Avdivka is extremely volatile, and indeed the situation in Donbass is very fragile, uh, and it is very worrisome, very worrisome. But we do understand that the Russian Federation is testing uh, everyone, is testing the West, is testing Ukraine, whether we could withstand such aggression. But what is important in my personal view, first, is to keep the sanctions on the agenda. The sanctions should be there, or even reinforced, because the developments around Avdivka, they testified once again why the sanctions are there. Because, because Russia violated international law, because Russia violated territorial integrity of another country. Secondly, uh, we do need international consolidated support of our partners, and we do have that. Regardless uh, of Russian narrative, regardless of different developments in different countries, I can definitely say that we do have support of our Western partners, the European Union, the United States and uh, many other like-minded countries who support Ukraine, not only because they sympathize with Ukraine, because they understand what, what consequences the breach, such grave breaches of international law leads to, and that there are rules that should be abided by. And thirdly, we have filed a number of international judicial actions or, or suits to the international courts to bring Russia responsible for its actions. And I do believe that it would be effective. I see. Now, uh, what's Ukraine's future strategy in diplomacy when dealing with uh, Russia? Well, I, I would say that our main goal is, first of all, to restore our territorial integrity. It includes illegally occupied Crimea and Donbass. Um, secondly, on after restoring, after the tro Russian troops get out of Ukraine, only after regaining control of the border, which is uncontrolled right now, the part of the border is totally uncontrolled, we could talk about something else. But as of now, we, sh we see no signs at all, at all, I would say, the, of Russian willingness to contribute to any of this particular, particular point. And of course, there is a very important aspect of uh, hostages which are taken by the Russian Federation, which are actually hostages of Russian aggressive policy against Ukraine. Hostages in Russia itself. We have uh, more than 15, I mean, officially known, but of course there could be much more Ukrainians that were abducted, illegally abducted and illegally taken to the Russian Federation and illegally actually sentenced there to different sentences. And there are lots of hostages in Donbass. And Russia does not allow the Red Cross to, to have access to them, to help people. And we even sometimes do not know exact figures and the exact conditions. And thirdly, of course, the hostages in the legally occupied Crimea. And as you know, in December, due to our diplomatic efforts, the uh, UN General Assembly resolution, a very important landmark resolution, was adopted um, by, by majority in the uh, UNGA to, uh, with regard to, to the Russian Federation actions in the illegally occupied Crimea. It was the first time when the UN said Russia is an aggressor, Russia is an occupying power. And this it was a very important step for it Ukraine, extremely, obviously. It is extremely important step, uh, step politically, because it is the first document, which is, uh, uh, of course, not the first document in general, because we had some documents within different parliamentary assemblies, and, for example, of the Council of Europe or the OEC. But this is a very landmark decision and landmark resolution uh, which is politically binding within the UN. And it is extremely binding for the Russian, uh, for the Russian Federation itself. And it's, it, is, it says, first, that Russia is an occupied state. Se second, that Russia is responsible for the aggression in, in, in the occupied Crimea. Third, that all human rights abuses should be halted and stopped immediately. And fourth, which is extremely important for us, we have been advocating for it for ages, that monitoring missions, permanent monitoring missions, which are absolutely independent, international, should be present in Crimea to document 
demand all the facts of tortures, abductions, killings, extrajudicial killings. And this is very, uh, very important, of course. It is extremely important it's very because important. the monitoring is, is being done. It is being done by the UN or OEC or other international organizations. For example, within the UN, we have roughly 16 reports, but they're made by distance, by working with journalists, experts, people. But it's extremely important to have people on the ground. But what Russia is afraid of? It, it, it is if there wasn't so the, many human, it is human rights of abuses, any monitors there, in there wouldn't be anything Crimea. like that. Exactly. Thank you so much for coming into the studio today. Welcome. We have been joined by Mariana Betsa. She's Ukraine's foreign ministry spokesperson. You're watching UATV.